All right, what's going on guys? Welcome to my office. This is the first of hopefully many videos that I will film in here. Uh, right now you guys are kind of facing my work area. You, you can't really see I have another monitor and everything behind me. But uh, yeah, man, this is where all of the uh, the work and all the coaching and everything goes down uh, is here. Obviously, I'm, I'm facing behind me when it goes down, but uh, this is kind of my little uh, area uh, of the new apartment. So uh, really happy with how uh, it's kind of turned out. Really nice to have my own dedicated workspace. I have a couple of other things uh, that I would like to do in here, but for now, uh, it, it definitely gets the job done. It beats the kitchen table that I was working at last year. So have uh, we've we've taken BTB into uh, it, its own office space as of now. So uh, I am filming this on July 9th. So hopefully all of you guys watching from the U.S. had a good Fourth of July. Had a pretty good. Fourth uh, of July myself, so just kind of getting back into the swing of things with training and nutrition afterwards. I kind of took a couple of days off uh, just to kind of enjoy some some family time and, and, and time with friends and stuff, and, and just kind of getting back into full uh, swing of things uh, myself. So we are going to do a Q and A today. So these questions were pulled from a TikTok video. Uh, that I posted, which got a bunch of good questions on it. I've gone through uh, and I have selected uh, 10 questions uh, that I feel were uh, good enough to make the cut. So uh, I, I did go through and reply to the other questions uh, that didn't make the video, but uh, these uh, questions here were the ones that made the cut uh, for, for this uh, particular video this week. So if you guys are not following me uh, on TikTok and you would like to participate in these Q&As going forward, then I would recommend that you do so. I have my TikTok account and username and everything uh, in the description below. So head over there and you can uh, register for your, your next opportunity to get questions asked uh, on the next Q&A. All right, so we'll just go ahead and get right into it. First question comes from Isaac Brown. He asks, do you feel that training full body every workout makes you more fatigued than a PPL split? So PPL obviously pertaining to push pull legs. Uh, Isaac is referencing my uh, latest style uh, of training that I've been using and the one that I'm currently using, which is full body training. Uh, to answer your question, Isaac, yes, it, it definitely makes me much more fatigued. The training sessions are considerably harder uh, in a full body split than what a push pull legs uh, style uh, split is. When you kind of take a look at a, a push pull leg uh, split, I, I need to be careful about how I say this, but a, a push day is a, a pretty uh, comparatively easy workout to, uh, you know, a, a full body session in this case, but e even say like a, a typical leg day uh, or something. I'm not saying that a push day is easy, but I'm saying that when you compare a push day to uh, a leg day, uh, it, it is considerably easier, comparatively easier. And basically what a, a full body session is, is it's the hardest stuff of your push day and the hardest stuff of your pull day and the hardest stuff of your leg day every single day. Like it, it, it's, it's very, very demanding training and with, uh, with a push-pull legs uh, style uh, of setup, particularly with push and pull, you have, you have a lot more room for like uh, m more specific type of things. So uh, specific rear delt stuff and, and having multiple different bicep curls and uh, all of those types of things. But when, when you kind of look at a full body split, there really is no room for junk like exercises. You know, you, you, you really are picking like one exercise for your back, one exercise for your biceps, one exercise for your chest. You're, you're really focusing on the most basic bang for your buck type of movements 
and just really trying to uh, master those at, at, at very, very high frequency. And, and by default, that's going to be more fatiguing. So uh, yes, the, the, the sessions are much more fatiguing with a full body split than uh, what they have been with push-pull legs. Next question comes from Luke Taylor. What's up, Luke? How's it going, man? Hope things uh, are going good with you. Uh, Luke uh, asks a really good question here. You get one source of protein, one source of carbohydrates, and one source of fat for the rest of your life. What three whole foods are you choosing? This is really tough. Um, if, if I had to pick one, man, okay, let's, let's start with protein. Protein, I would probably go with steak, maybe something like a sirloin steak. Uh, something that has a little bit of fat on it, but is not super fatty. Uh, I, I could eat that for every meal uh, easily. That, that would be good. Uh, carbohydrates, I think I'm going to go with white rice here. Uh, I think especially with steak, the steak and rice combo is, uh, is super, super good. And then fats, this is the one that's really hard for me. I'm, I'm kind of torn between... Uh, so some of, some of these are, are purely for, uh, taste purposes. Most of them are actually cheese. Uh, I really like cheese. Uh, dark chocolate, uh, is a really good one as well. Uh, nut butter, peanut butter, almond butter, cashew butter. Uh, but if I, if I really only had to pick one, this may be controversial, but I'm going to go with whole eggs. Now, some people probably consider whole eggs a protein source and you're, you can be right on that too. Like, you know, whole eggs are a really good source of fat and protein. So they're kind of an anomaly, but um, I'm, I'm kind of operating under the assumption that I'm going to be having all three of these things as a meal together and uh, steak rice and eggs for every meal would be uh in incredible honestly that, that would be amazing so uh th those would be my choices steak white rice and whole eggs next question comes from moozy what's your current stack just test uh, everybody loves the uh the, the gear questions uh, so currently, as of the time of me r making this video, I have been running 150 milligrams of test for probably five weeks now. Uh, I've been cruising. Before the, the cruise that I've started, I was running 400 milligrams of test. So um, that's it. Nothing, nothing else. 400 megs of test. Uh, after I finish the cruise that I'm currently on, uh, I would like to maybe try 500. 400 has been the most that I've, I've taken ever. So, uh, I kind of would like to creep the dose up a little bit and kind of see what happens with that. But, uh, as of now, I'm making really good progress on test and test only. So there's really no need in my head, you know, at this point in time to really try more because the, the test, uh, you know, I, th I, I'm, I can still progress within that and still make good progress. So uh, things are, are, are looking to be that way for the foreseeable future. Next question comes from Jimmy Worm. Uh, Jimmy Worm is spelled gummy worm with a U and, or a, a Y instead of a U, which is great. I, I love that. Uh, they ask, how do you know if you need to raise dietary fats during a cut? Um, so you probably don't, uh, is, is the answer to this, at least from, from my perspective. Now, obviously there's, there's going to be some, some very, you know, specific scenarios where, where that's not the case, but I, I would say for the most part that as long as your dietary fat intake is coming from, uh, quality fat sources. So let's just kind of give some whole food examples here, whole eggs, uh, preferably monounsaturated fats like avocados, avocado oil, um, macadamia nut oil, extra virgin olive oil, uh, nut butters, almond uh, butter is, seems to be a really, really good one health-wise. Um, lots of, of really good fat sources. If your fat sources are coming from those, I, I think that the amount of fat that we really need to take in is maybe a little bit less than uh, than 
what you know that the numbers say i'm not saying that we should go that route and that's the route that uh uh, I recommend that we go, but I think that we can we can go lower than what is recommended without fear is basically what I'm I'm trying to say. So I I, I think definitely to an extent like there is a, a floor like of how low that we can go with the fats, but from my personal experience, even having really low fat intake, let's say like 40 grams of fat a day or even less. I, I mean, I've, I've had my fats rocked out at like 15 grams, like ridiculously low. As long as those are coming from uh, like uh, omega-3 fatty acid rich sources. Uh, and then a, a lot of the ones that I, I kind of mentioned earlier, I, I haven't really noticed too many uh, like issues from, from that personally uh, and, and with a lot of clients as well. Now, if it is something that you're really worried about, then I would get your blood work taken. Uh, a, a lot of the, the concern or risk with low dietary fat intake is, is going to come from how that affects uh, you hormonally. And if you have concerns about how your hormones are, uh, are responding and, and where they should be at, then that would not be something that I would, you know, guess on. I would go get some blood work taken so that you have an actual, you know, figure in front of you of, of what your, your hormone levels are. I mean, you can, you can convince yourself that your testosterone levels are low all you want, but if, if you don't have, data and and proof to back that up like i i just i don't like to make uh dietary decisions based off of what's going on in here versus what's not happening on blood work so now let's let's kind of give you some maybe some some quantitative things uh, I, I guess to take home like like actual signs uh i let's say you are you're waking up I, i'm assuming that this is a, a male that is asking this question um, if you're not waking up with morning wood on a consistent basis, then maybe that would be a sign that your hormone levels are uh, not in a good spot. Uh, just general sexual drive, like w what that looks like if it's low, then that may be something to uh, explore deeper through blood work. Uh, sleep uh, being impacted, not being able to, to get good sleep. Now that raises a question of is the low testosterone causing poor sleep or is your poor sleep causing low testosterone? That's, uh, that's kind of a who came first, chicken or the egg type of thing. Maybe irritability to a certain extent. I think that irritability is uh, kind of part and parcel of, of an aggressive deficit or being in a deficit for a prolonged period of time. But usually the you know the the testosterone is going to be the main concern and and usually that you know shows itself through poor recovery in and out of the gym uh and or lack of sexual drive so th those would be the main things that i would kind of pay attention to there next question comes from Ye ray or Ye ray i'm not sure how this is pronounced but they ask how to structure an upper lower with two or three rotations um, so you just will simply use different exercises on each one of your different rotations. So let's say upper, let's say you're going to have three upper sessions, upper A, upper B, upper C. On each upper workout, you're going to have one chest movement. So on upper A, let's do a dumbbell press on, uh, upper B, let's do a machine press. And on upper C, let's do a Smith press on each upper workout. You're going to do one lateral raise movement. So on upper A, you do a dumbbell lateral, upper B, you do a cable lateral, and then upper C, if you have a machine lateral, you do that. On each upper day, you're going to need a lat movement. So uh, on upper A, you do a, a machine pull down, upper B, you do a cable row, and on upper C, you do a assisted pull up. You, you, you kind of see where I'm going with this. You just pick different exercises for each session. And then you just kind of rotate back and forth uh, between them. Um, no, no matter how limited of a gym that you train at, for the most part, I mean, I, I guess I need to be careful with what I'm saying. Some people have home gyms and are extremely limited with stuff. But for the most part, even if you go to, like in the U.S., a Planet Fitness, like one of the most like limited 
you know, gyms equipment wise, you're going to be able to throw together two to three different rotations uh, of, of sessions with different exercises uh, available to you in each one. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple thing to, to do, I, I guess, when you break it down that way. But I, I think a lot of people are probably operating under the assumption that they need to do a bunch of different exercises in order to get the job done. And that's not the case. Like you can get the job done with one or two exercises per muscle group. And then just, you know, there, there's, there's probably six or eight chest exercises total in the entire gym that you can do. So just do like one or two of them on one day and one and two of them on another day and then one or two of them on the third day and then just repeat through there. Next question comes from AJ Roth. If you have 10 grams of complete protein and 10 grams of incomplete protein, does it give you 20 grams of complete protein? Yes. Uh, so this, you know, a common thing that I'll see people talk about and, and recommend is uh, counting protein from you know, trace sources, like counting the protein in your oatmeal and rice and all of that stuff. Look, you, you know, you can, you can do it with, with either one. Uh, you can do it with either approach. And as long as you're being consistent with it, it's going to work either way. Uh, but the protein that is in those foods definitely do count because when they are eaten with a complete protein, all of the protein becomes complete. So you may only be getting 30 grams of protein from the chicken, but maybe you get five from the rice and you get two from your veggies and then maybe, you know, whatever, like it all, it all counts. So yes, count all of it. All of it counts. Next question comes from David Nilsson. First time starting a bulk, how do you calculate the duration of it if you don't know how you will look? You don't. Um, so th these, uh, you know, th this is kind of a common uh, thing that I will see uh, people talk about is they're going to do a 16 week bulk or they're going to do a 24 week bulk. You know, they plan out in advance how long that phase is going to last. And that's not something that you can do. Uh, bodybuilding is a lot like surfing in, in a way. Uh, I, I don't remember where I first heard this quote, but someone that I follow, if, if it pops up to me, I'll overlay it here, uh, had mentioned uh, that bodybuilding is a lot like surfing. You know, a, a surfer's job is not to go out and create a wave on the water. It is a surfer's job to ride the wave while it's there. And in a lot of ways, I, I feel like that relates to bodybuilding too. You, you, you could do a 12 week bulk and 10 weeks into it, you could have blown the whole thing off the rails and you look terrible. You could have planned to do a 12 week bulk and at week 12, you still look amazing and could probably push another 12 weeks. So these are not things that you plan in advance. At, at least in my opinion, you shouldn't plan the timeline uh, of these things. What you should do is, in my opinion, is, is you should make a plan and then you should have periods of time, whether it's every week, whether it's every uh, 10 days, whether it's every 14 days where you take progress pictures and you assess the changes in the body weight between the sets of progress pictures and then determine what's happened in the gym and, and all of those types of things. And then you kind of depend based off of that. But uh, th these are not things that you can plan out, um, you know, just, just to kind of give uh, my personal like experiences or or like experience with with clients and stuff is I I never I I I, I very very rarely will say we are going to bulk for X amount of weeks I have never done that with myself I have with myself I have never committed to a bulking phase and said it's going to be this amount of time the goal for me is to make that time last as long as I possibly can and sometimes that's six months and sometimes that's thirteen months you know it's a lot like surfing sometimes you jump on a wave and it's quick and it's over and sometimes you ride a wave and it's glorious. I've, I've never surfed, so I don't, you know, I don't actually know if, if that's the case, but I can imagine that, that there's very similar parallels there. So you, uh, you, you don't calculate a time frame. 
you just take it as it comes to you and then you you do what you can and to to extend it and and manage it appropriately so that it's it's not over too quick next question comes from the, this person has no username it's just a bunch of symbols they ask a great question this is an og fan uh, what was your favorite gun back in the cod days this is a hard question to answer because I had a lot. The, the first one that pops to my head is the Black Ops 2 M8. Uh, I competed in Black Ops 2 and the, the M8 was kind of the gun for AR players. So uh, I, I used that gun a lot. Um, another one that popped into my head was uh, Modern Warfare 3, the original Modern Warfare 3, the ACR. Uh, for the same reason, I competed in Modern Warfare 3 and used the ACR a lot. Uh, and then the third one would be, uh, this, is, this is a tie between either the FAMAS from Black Ops 1 or the Galil from Black Ops 1. And then actually, as I just said that, the Modern Warfare 2 AK-47. So... Those, those are uh, a tie. All assault rifles. I was, I was always an assault rifle player. I had a lot of SMGs that I liked, but I was always primarily a assault rifle player. So I have a certain affinity to a lot of the, the old school ARs. Great question. All right, next question comes from B, and they ask, how was post-show for you? And if I have any advice for handling post-show. Uh, post show for me was actually really good. Um, I think there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, one is I've kind of gotten my um, like my my ugly days. Uh, I, I you know I don't want to say the word ugly like in a bad way. I've kind of gotten my like binge eating days like out of the past. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I've done th th this was my first contest prep, but this was not the first time that I have done. Uh, a long drawn out caloric deficit phase. So um, this is a kind of a different topic, but I, I get asked somewhat frequently about like <clears throat> binging and, and stuff like that and, and work with clients who uh, have binged or do binge and, and all that type of stuff. And I think a lot of that just comes from, from my experience, a, a lot of people who are dealing with binging issues are very early on in their bodybuilding uh, like journey, career, however it is that you kind of want to phrase this. The, the first couple of times that you do a, a, di a diet phase and a deficit phase, you're kind of like, what do I do from here? Like you, you, you kind of have a, a difficult time like handling that. But after you've kind of gone through this for a bunch of years and you, you've done a bunch of dieting phases and you've done a bunch of bulking phases, you just become more experienced with how to, how to manage that. So um, I, I didn't really have any major like binging um, issues uh, or, or anything like that. I definitely ate a lot of food, but I, ne I never once felt like I was eating food uh, out of control. Um, never once. Uh, I, I mean, I, I never had any like absolutely ridiculously insane like meals. You know what I mean? I, I was still tracking my calories like through the whole time or at least like estimating those uh, most days. So um, and, and I think another reason of how I managed it so well is that it's kind of my job to manage this like with other people so obviously like as a full-time coach like I, I work with a lot of people that have uh issues whether it's post-show or just after a long diet like dealing with uh food related things so uh i it, it, when you deal with it on a frequent basis whether it's with yourself or whether it's through helping other people it's uh, pretty, I don't, I definitely don't want to say easy, but it's definitely easier to, to kind of manage it. So, um, now I did have some swelling and some edema, which was very strange. Um, I didn't use like any like diuretics or anything like that. My, 
my supplements were pretty mild for uh, for my first sup, uh, first show, but I, I did notice within like the first couple of weeks, like the first two weeks uh, after the show, particularly at night, my feet and ankles would swell up really bad to the point where it was really painful. They were so like uh, swollen up. Uh, I think a lot of that was the the rebound and kind of gaining a lot of water weight and uh, glycogen and and stuff like that. But that that was kind of tough uh, to deal with. Now, as far as advice for handling post-show, I would pick your foods extremely uh, like wise. Uh, I think an important part of nutrition post-show uh, is to get fairly aggressive with reintroducing calories. Um, obviously, depending on how lean you got during your show will determine on how aggressive that that is, but... Uh, I, I definitely think that getting fairly uh, aggressive with your food increase is necessary. Uh, the, the, the condition that you're in or should be in when you're stepping on stage is not a condition that you kind of want to live your life at. So I think it's important to get to a healthy, manageable body fat uh, percentage uh, quicker, quicker rather than, than later. So... Uh, I, I would be assertive with your calorie increases and I would just make sure that those uh, are preferably not from coming from highly palatable foods. Uh, you know, if, <clears throat> if you start uh, fitting cookies and stuff like that into your macros after, uh, after a show, like it, th that may encourage you to cheat and, and binge more. But uh, if you're just kind of mindful with the foods uh, and everything and ideally be eating the same foods that you were eating during prep and just kind of scale those up, uh, I think that would make things a little bit more enjoyable. Uh, obviously, now that the show is over, this is a time where I recommend like having scheduled meals that you go out with a uh, significant other uh, or something like that, uh, especially somebody who just finished up a, a show who's in a relationship. I think it's important to give that time back. Uh, to their significant other. So uh, definitely not saying that there are like no uh, cheat meals or that you shouldn't have those, but I think that you should uh, fit those in your plan like uh, if, if you can. So, and then I think the, the uh, another piece of advice that's really important uh, is I would have a plan before the show. Like I, I would have a plan, you know, uh, Saturday I'm going to do this, Sunday I'm going to do this, and then Monday I'm going to be back on plan with this, this, and this, and this, da-da-da type of stuff. So I think having a plan uh, for what happens after the show is pretty important instead of just literally stepping off stage and going, okay, now what? Because then that's kind of when the, the floodgates uh, tend to, to open up as well. So hopefully there was something that you could take there. And then the final question, this is a good one to end on. This comes from Ethan. What is the go-to cheat meal? Uh, I've answered this one on Instagram a couple of times. I am uh, white trash uh, in the sense I love McDonald's, man. I, I, I really, really enjoy uh, McDonald's. And as crazy as it sounds, McDonald's does not really uh, cause me digestive issues. There's a lot of fast food stuff that does just absolutely destroy my stomach, but... Uh, I really enjoy McDonald's and for whatever reason, McDonald's does not upset my stomach. So I really like McDonald's. Um, I also like pizza. Pizza's uh, pretty good. Um, so a, a good pizza is, is a good uh, cheat meal to have there. Um, honestly, those, those are like the first two that come uh, to mind. So the, 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 those are usually, if, if I am so, so to say, going to go off the rails uh, with my nutrition, I guess those would probably be the, the things uh, that I usually do it with. All right, guys, thanks so much for everybody who uh, asked questions. Uh, like I said, I uh, only have time to kind of pick uh, a few of them, but I, I went through and, and answered everybody's question, whether it was through the video or whether it was through written response. Um, just as I mentioned earlier, if these kind of things interest you guys and you want to have your questions uh, answered potentially on the next one, then go ahead and, and follow my TikTok over there. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can get uh, the opportunity to ask your questions there. 
Um, yeah, if there's anything else that you guys have, then please leave it in the comments below. Uh, as always, guys, thank you for watching. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already, and take care of yourselves, guys. Stay tuned for the next one. Uh.